Good afternoon, Tonsay, and welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. Today we're focusing on Indigenous women in charge, from female chiefs to a national leader, and women who want to take on more leadership roles. We'll look into the rise of, in women in leadership roles and some of the hardships they face. And as always, we want you to join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN In Focus or you can email infocus at aptn.ca. Now, before I introduce you to our guests today, let's take a look at where we're at in terms of leadership on First Nations uh, across the country. According to Indigenous Services Canada, as of 2022, there are 522 male chiefs. Women make up a quarter of that with only 170 female chiefs across the country. Now, when it comes to band counselors, nearly 2,000 are men and just over 1,000 are women. Now, these numbers don't include councils who are not required to share their election results with Indigenous Services Canada. Now, joining us now is Grand Chief Kathy Merrick, the first woman to lead the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. Now, Grand Chief, uh, we really appreciate you uh, joining us here in studio. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so I just mentioned some numbers about you know, female chiefs across the country compared to male. What goes through your minds when you see those numbers? We've come a long way in terms of a woman coming into leadership and coming to become chiefs of their nations. Back in the day, in the, the 70s and the 80s, you would very rarely hear of, uh, of women taking leadership roles. And so we kind of changed throughout time. And for Manitoba itself, we have, uh, I believe it's nine women chiefs and 80 women counselors from, from their respective communities. So even that has changed uh, in terms of having uh, women counselors representing their, their nations. So you've been in your role, you were elected uh, just over a, a, a month ago now, I guess. So in that short, short time, you I mean, how, how's it been? I imagine incredibly busy. It has been. I've been there a month and three days. I keep the count. And uh, it's been very busy in terms of uh, being invited to, to, uh, to speak at events and being able to meet people, meet leadership and... It's very exciting to, it's, a, it's busy, but a good busy, mm. right? And uh, just the other day, just yesterday, we were in Ottawa and we got to meet the Prime Minister. And so even to that, uh, meeting the National uh, Women's Chief was a, a great honor for myself to, to be able to, to look up to women in powerful leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we're talking about Indigenous women in charge today. So why is it important a, a woman is leading the AMC after so many years of, of men leading the, the helm, so to speak? It's, it's, a, it's a time and place for women to take that, that role. It's crucial for our people at this point in time of our, in our lives and how the uh, governments have uh, treated us. And it's up to the woman to take the to take the stand to be able to speak on behalf of their people and to be able to correct the wrongs of what government has uh, has has done to our people. And we need to be able to be vocal to be able to to relay the messaging from the from the community from the First Nation level to the governments. Mm -hmm. And we speak as women. We speak from the heart. We speak on the fact that we are the life givers for our children that, and that we be able to, to put in place a, a, a journey for, the, for our children. So it can be a little bit better than our journey at the present time. Well, yeah, you had just touched on, I guess, uh, um, some of the maybe foundational differences of, of how a, a man would lead as opposed to a woman. So can you touch... A little bit more on that leading into my next question is just what are some of the main differences really and and maybe how um it's led well with uh we live with we well ever 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 leader leads with the heart mm -hmm. 
but as a woman, as a, as a mother, as a grandmother, as a giver of life, we, we, we tend to uh, be able to hold our children closer to our hearts and to ensure that we, uh, we be able and capable of taking care of them. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the government, what they have done to our people in terms of Bill C-92, where they, they tried to prove that we couldn't take care of our children. Right. But we are very much so at, uh, at, a, at a time where we need to be able to speak to it and uh, the injustice that has been done to our people need to be corrected. And it's the women that are gonna correct that. Yeah. So what do you think it means for other women in leadership roles and, and the youth to see a woman as, as the grand chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs? I believe that uh, we, we, we have uh, broken some barriers in terms of having a woman in the leadership of uh, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. And to be able to be supported by the majority of the chiefs is a, a great honor for myself and that, that they be able to uh, believe in what I can bring forth in terms of, uh, of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. To be able to lead them in a good way, in a good heart, to be able to speak in a good way, in a good heart for our people here in Manitoba. Realizing that uh, we, are, we do make up 22% of the total population of indigenous people here in Manitoba, mm -hmm. right? right, And yet we're, uh, we're the poorest of the poor. And, and that shouldn't be. And, and the government needs to listen to, to the voices, to the leadership in Manitoba here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just in relation to that last question, do you have any advice for, uh, you know, a woman or, or, you know, a little girl who's maybe thinking, you know, seeing you and is like, oh, maybe I want to, you know, take on some sort of leadership, whether yes, it just be in, sure. in their community even or, you know. Yes, like for sure. I would so encourage our, our young women, our little girls that are out there being able to see that uh, having a, a woman in the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs leadership, that uh, they can do it too. That they can, that they can take that, uh, and never to be scared to to take that step to 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 be in these positions. It's not an easy journey. It wasn't an easy journey for myself to uh, to become a leader in in my community, and I was basically uh, groomed through time, mm -hmm. through my when I was in council as well. I was there for over ten years. So I, I had to learn, and when I, uh, when I did seek for the chief of my community, it took a while, I didn't get, no, I didn't get uh, picked right away, right? right? Yeah. But uh, a lot of times we need to be able to prove that we are very capable of, uh, of, uh, of doing the job. We're not uh, in terms of, um, being strong, we're not strong as our men, and we will always depend on our men mm -hmm. to do the, to do that work. But in terms of being able to to bring light to our communities, it's the woman that does that, right. and it's the woman that uh, that take care of the community. It sure is, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to sort of just change subjects a little bit, but still on the same subject. Now, um, one of the things that some people might be wondering. Um, is, is the wearing of, of a headdress. Now, will, will you be wearing a, a headdress in the future? Yes, I will be. Okay. And uh, it's not necessarily a man's headdress. Right. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and I don't take it lightly because uh, we did ask in ceremony to, to see what, what we were going to do in terms of my leadership. Mm -hmm. I never wore a headdress when I was chief. Right. And so we asked in, in, in ceremony as to uh, what we would be able to do. So uh, we'll have a headdress ceremony come hopefully at the end of January. Okay. And it's going to be, uh, uh, it was, the, the messaging through ceremony was it's time to bring back 
what uh, the women leaders wore back, back, our what our ancestors wore at that time. Mm -hmm. And before we, so that's going to be super encouraging to see you there. with yes, that. I'm, I'm sure. sure we will be there as well for, for, for sure. that ceremony. Yes. Um, but before we let you go, I just sort of wanted to ask an overall question um, about everything we're talking about and why is it so important to see just Indigenous women in leadership roles in whether, you know, it be government or politics or like, like I mentioned, in their own community. Why is that so important? It's important because, uh, and I think I said it earlier that uh, it's a woman that's going to 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 take that lead to to the wellness of our people. There's so many, so many addictions, so many things that we are put through from uh, from residential school, from day schools, from sixty school, from taking our children out out of our homes, because people people in government didn't think that we were capable of taking care of our children mm -hmm. and that's not right how, how would they you know i can't imagine that happening so we need to change the way that uh, people think and view of our people mm -hmm. that we are capable we do have good hearts it's just that there are obstacles in in how we we take care of our our own and that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be because uh, we can do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, uh, of very educated, bright First Nation young people that are eventually gonna, gonna take over and they are eventually, maybe they're not gonna be as kind as we are, yeah. but they're gonna be, they're gonna do right for their people as well. Well, they certainly are and it's, uh, it, it helps that, you know, somebody like yourself is leading the charge as well. So, uh, Grand Chief Mayor, I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, for you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to leave our interview there, but we certainly appreciate you taking some time uh, for us today. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for the invite. All right, we have to step aside for a short break. We'll have a more Women in Leadership talk when we come back. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. The month of October marked the 30th anniversary of women in Canadian history. Our reporter Annette Francis reminds us of a trailblazer from the Ojibwe community of Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario. It's a memorable time for Rita Rose, sorting through old photos and sharing stories of her late mother, Elsie Knott. Knott is celebrated as not only Curve Lake's first female chief, but the first in Canada as well. In 1951, the Indian Act was amended to allow First Nations women to participate in banned elections. Three years later, when Rita was 11 years old, she remembers her mother had been asked by some members to run for chief. She was always helping before that, like she was helping with uh, baseball and things going on in Curve Lake, like uh, the Homemakers Club and different in the church. So I guess maybe they saw that leadership quality in her and then they came and asked her to run. So she did. And uh, she was really surprised when she went. Rita says her mother had a convincing spirit and unconventional ideas. With no funding, she bought a hearse to get the kids to high school that, uh, in a nearby community. After a while, she, she was able to uh, get bigger buses because more children wanted to go. She drove the bus for over 30 years. All right, our next guest is Cora Voyager, a Dene woman from the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. She is a sociology professor at the University of Calgary, and her research specializes in Indigenous women's leadership. She joins me now. Dr. Voyager, thank you so much for joining us here on APTN in Focus. Uh, we're talking about all things uh, women in leadership and prominent roles. So my first question, or it's not really a question, I guess, is can you just maybe tell us about some of the things you've been working on in terms of Indigenous women uh, in leadership roles? 
Well, I did the first academic uh, study of women leaders, uh, political leaders in in Canada, and I'm also now doing a follow up study, uh, doing a comparison between uh, male and male and female leaders, the experiences, as well as what uh, the community expects. Um, you know, the differences between the expectations of um, male and female leaders. Um, so with my first study, I studied uh, women chiefs in Canada, and I followed that up with a study of women councillors in Canada. And with the first study, as I mentioned, there were, you know, very um, kind of random accounts of women in leadership in the Indigenous community, but there had never been a full academic study. And I interviewed uh, 63 of the then 90 uh, women chiefs in Canada and found some very interesting uh, information about them. For example, um, about three quarters of them had some form of post-secondary education, which was very high at that time because uh, post-secondary education in the First Nation community was running about 40 percent. So this um, was a very educated group. They were also, um, three quarters of these women were um, from what I call politically involved families. So they came from political families within the reserve community. And what I also found was that they felt that they were less likely to be a uh, charismatic leader uh, than males. And also the types of uh, duties that they were given and the expectations that they had was that um, they were expected to deal with what I called soft issues, child care, mm -hmm. elder care, uh, education, social services within the community, whereas they felt at that time that they were expected, not necessarily expected, um, to deal with you know, hard issues like economic development, housing, um, those types of things. So how has that sort of changed in, in the, you know, in the, in the women that you interviewed? How, like, what have you learned and how has it changed over the years from when you first did it to maybe a little more recently? More recently, there seems to be uh, more of an acceptance of women leaders. Uh, there uh, was some resistance at the beginning. I, I found that uh, there was an expectation that leaders in the community were going to be male. And of course, this tied specifically to the Indian Act because we know that uh, women were not allowed to participate um, in meetings, uh, political meetings, and they were not allowed to stand for office or vote in uh, banned elections until 1951. So there was a bit of resistance and some of the women said that, you know, community members and elders, you know, resisted them and said that they didn't believe that women should be chief. Well, and, and now the this has changed. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off there. Um, th so the okay. first female chief was elected in the 1950s. And yes. I'm just, I, I'd love to get your perspective on how maybe things have changed since then, given all the work you've done on, on female chiefs specifically. So like, like I just mentioned, the first chief in the 1950s, and there's more now, which is great to see. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering in, in that time frame, maybe what were some of the difficulties and how everything has sort of changed leading up to our current day. Okay. From when the first woman chief was elected, uh, Elsie Knott at Curve Lake in Ontario, uh, for that decade, that first decade, there was about 10 women chiefs across, um, across Canada. What we have found now is that about one in five or one in six uh, chiefs in Canada are women. Most uh, of the women chiefs are in British Columbia, and as we know, there are um, about one third of the First Nations in Canada are in British Columbia, who seem to be very progressive and um, very willing to um, elect women to deal with issues that they are are dealing with in their communities. So, you know, having to deal with uh, with industry, you know, in uh, forestry, fisheries, uh, mining, you know, those types of um, of issues, and. What I found was that there was an increase uh, in the number of women chiefs from uh, 45 to 90 uh, in the 
uh, 1990s. And there was a leveling off, and now there seems to be the numbers are creeping up again. And Dr. Voyager, what are some of the challenges uh, a, a woman faces when it comes to maybe running an election or after being elected as chief? I mean, have you seen anything or heard anything? I know you mentioned um, sometimes they're relied on for maybe the softer issues, right? So just curious about that angle as well. What, uh, what I found was that um, women were still expected to deal with family issues. You know, many of these women were uh, middle-aged women, so they had children, grandchildren, as well as, um, you know, perhaps aging parents. And they were, you know, what I called a member of the sandwich generation. So they were kind of the meat in the sandwich and expected to deal with a lot of issues. So not just within their family, but also within uh, their community. Um, people were expected to, or chiefs were expected to, also deal with, um, you know, you know, if there's a crisis in the in the community, they are expected to, you know, come forward with that. And not so much in the way that men were. I mean, women are expected to, you know, help cook for a feast or, uh, you know, help cook for a wake and these types of things. And that wasn't something that was expected of men. And what we also found was that the female relatives of the men were more likely to help them uh, with their duties than uh, they were the women. And also what the women found was that a lot of the social support that they had um, within their community c kind of fell away when they took that leadership role. And they had to work very hard to um, be seen as not changing as a result of power. And with men, that wasn't necessarily so. And I just want to move, uh, it's still on the same topic, but moving away from the, the female chiefs for a second. What are you seeing in terms of other women taking prominent leadership roles, whether it be in business or, or like a, another sector? What, what have you seen in, in that regard, Dr. Boyger? Well, this past year, we have seen some really big, um, you know, uh, situations where women have moved into leadership roles. Of course, we have Mary Mae Simon, who is our Governor General. We have Roseanne Archibald, who was elected to the uh, National Chief role uh, for the Assembly of First Nation. And now we have uh, a, an Indigenous woman on the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, Michelle uh, Obamsawin. So, you know, women are really moving forward. We have also um, a woman who is the uh, leader of the First Nation University of Canada at, in Regina, uh, Jackie Ottman. So we have women moving into very prominent roles in, in our society. And that doesn't surprise me at all, because what we know with women is that they are um, more likely to be educated um, than men. Uh, generally, um, you know, what we've seen is about a three to one um, ratio of um, degree uh, attainment for women. And I see this as a result of women uh, more likely to have, uh, you know, more likely to be uh, single parents uh, leading um, uh, single parent households. And the type of women, the type of jobs that women do um, are not well-paying jobs. So about one third of our uh, uh, employed uh, population are what we would call tertiary positions, um, sales and service. But also what we also know is that one third of our female population, um, employment population are uh, in administration, business and finance. Right. So those two are, um, are you know leveling each other out and dr boyser i'd love to get your opinion on on this next question here um why is it important to see indigenous women taking on these leadership roles whether it be a, a female chief or moving into a political role or, or a, you know a, having their own business or just just anything like that like why is it so important that these women are taking on these leadership roles well, I think it's important because women have always played an important role traditionally in our society. And it was when Europeans uh, contact happened that they were essentially 
taken um, in to uh, or taken out of that role and supplanted by men. And this was European influence. And what happened in many communities was that the uh, acceptance of those outside uh, rules in our community meant that women were officially taken out of those uh, positions. But as we know, uh, unofficially, you know, women were very much in. Um, uh, you know, ask for their advice and, and those types of things. And, you know, women are very much uh, the administrators within our communities. And they have, you know, their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the community. They know, you know, where uh, the challenges are, they know where the strengths are. And I think it's important uh, for them to be in those leadership roles because they, you know, they have a sense of what's going on in the community. And before we let you go here, Dr. Voyager, um, where do you see the number of women in leadership roles going? Is it, do you see it going up, maybe staying the same? Well, like what, what do you see in terms of the future of women in leadership? I see the numbers going up. As I mentioned before, there was a doubling of the numbers um, until uh, the mid-1990s. Then there was a plateau. and then uh, they started creeping up again. So I can see this number going up. Well, that's certainly great to hear. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, Dr. Voyager, but I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, to you for taking some time out of your day and sharing your perspectives and your insight into uh, what we're talking about with women in leadership roles, uh, Indigenous women in leadership roles. So big thank you, Miigwech, to you for joining us. Merci, <laughs> Joe. All right, let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Daryl. Online, we asked our followers why they think it's important to see women in leadership roles. We got a lot of response on our APTN News Instagram page. Let's take a look. First from Sue, she says, it's important for younger generations to see what women can do to inspire their own dreams. Squibb says, because matriarchs think generationally. From Nicole, our matriarchs have been stripped of so much honor and respect, it's time to see them shine again. Alicia says, because the patriarchal systems in place are failing everyone, especially women and children, men created the current failing colonial resource extraction dumpster fire. From user Rise Up, our women are, were matriarchs, they led with love and good intention to ensure equity. Lastly, from Brittany, because stats show that people perform better and feel better with women in positions above them. Thank you to everyone that took the time to respond. If you want to share your thoughts on women in leadership, here's how. Send an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Or follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus. All right, it's time for one final break. We'll have more APTN in focus when we come back. Welcome back. Joining us now is Métis National Council President Cassidy Karen. Karen took over the role just a little over a year ago now after previously serving uh, four years as a provincially elected representative of the Métis Nation of British Columbia. President Karen, thanks so much for joining us here on APTN in Focus. Um, you've been president of the Métis National Council now for uh, just over a year, um, right? So how's this past year uh, been for you? It's been a really incredible year. It's been an incredibly busy year with all of the work that uh, we've been doing at the Métis National Council, you know, not only just within uh, the Secretariat and with our governing members of the Métis National Council, but a lot of really large global events happening as well that has included the Métis Nation. So lots of different events um it's been incredibly busy but it's, it's been a really positive year a lot of positive growth and a lot of positive development as we continue to move forward the metis nation and there's been no shortage of uh, adversity as well i imagine for you since having been elected um you know the mmf leaving a lawsuit against the mmf and others uh, i'm just curious to know like how do you deal with some of the challenges that you face and will continue to face uh, leading this organization Honestly, it's through continuing to ground myself with our, our communities and with elders to make sure that 
everything that I'm doing as I as I do this work at the national level, advancing the Métis voice at the national and international levels is really grounded from our communities up. And I do that through constant communication with our governing members, constant communication with citizens and communities all across the Métis Nation homeland and a lot of support from my elders. And you had mentioned some of the highlights just before I had asked that last question. So what are some of the highlights uh, since you've become president? I think, you know, the first one top of mind is our annual General Assembly at the Métis National Council. We just wrapped up our General Assembly about three weeks ago, the first one since my election, and it was extremely positive. So much work has been done in this last year, so much work to bring the Métis Nation closer together, to find different ways to collaborate as we evolve, as we evolve towards, you know, really um, seeing through some of the visions that our ancestors have have dreamt of for many, many generations. And uh, as we move towards those, you know, we need to evolve together. We need to work together. We need to collaborate more. And we're finding those different ways of doing so. And I think the General Assembly that we just completed really showed that positive movement forward. And I'm very happy with that. And that's right now the, the number one highlight that's top of my mind. But of course, there's been so many incredible things that have happened throughout this last year. Um, we've been able to really since last March when travel opened up, uh, of course, we're still um, dealing with the pandemic, but travel opened up a little bit more and we were able to travel throughout uh, the Métis Nation homeland and visiting with communities, learning their stories, sharing those stories at the national and international level so that we can continue to influence change for the Métis Nation. So why is it important for the Métis National Council to have a woman leader um, after, you know, so many years with men leading the charge? Well, there's a number of different reasons. And, uh, you know, the one that I've, I've talked with my elders and, and a lot of community members about is that women in the Métis Nation have a different perspective to bring to leadership roles. Women are uh, life bearers, life givers. So we inherently have uh, the big picture when, when we lead. We have a big picture looking forward into the future generations to try to build a brighter future for the next generations to come. And so we bring a really unique perspective to leadership. And, you know, within the Métis Nation, women have played an incredible role throughout our history. And a lot of those stories, you know, they, they go untold. We have, of course, our heroes of the Métis Nation, Louis Riel and Gabriel Dumont. But there's been some really incredible leaders in the background, women leaders in the background that have done so much incredible work to help the nation get to where we are today. And so, you know, I take it on as, as my responsibility to start uncovering some of those stories and uplifting our women who have, who have really brought us to where we are today and to bring that unique perspective to, to this leadership role. And so what can you bring that uh, somebody else can't or maybe that uh, a male couldn't in this role right now? Well, that's a, a really fascinating question. Um, you know, I think everybody has their own unique skills, regardless of if you're male, female, or gender diverse. Um, everybody has a role to play within our nation. Uh, for me specifically, I think the skills that I bring to this position is being able to foster that inclusivity, to bring as many diverse voices to the table as possible. When we think about you know, building a nation, moving forward, we need to do what we can to represent the diversity of the Métis Nation. And we can only do that by bringing more voices to the table. And so I see myself as a facilitator of that collaboration and bringing more voices to the table so that we're doing this in a good way to ensure that the Métis Nation moves forward to build a brighter future for everybody. And what kinds of barriers, um, you know, do Indigenous women face when it comes to, you know, getting into these leadership roles or, or trying to get into some of these leadership roles? I think there's a number of challenges. And, you know, I think one of the challenges that, that we face as women in leadership is actually talking about the challenges that we face. But it's so important that we do talk about the challenges that we face as, as Indigenous women in leadership 
because if we don't, then we're not going to be finding solutions and we're going to be leaving those challenges for the next generations to come. So talking about the challenges is incredibly important. One of the challenges, obviously, that I, I face as a young uh, Métis leader is um, ageism and misogyny. Still, wherever I go, there's always going to be individuals in a room who um you know who don't take me as seriously um until you know until i bring the voice of our communities to that table and uh, and show um individuals that you know we deserve to be here as as women leaders as young women leaders um you know you really have to earn that respect in a way that i think men maybe don't have to work as hard for um, I, I'm not discounting anybody's uh, unique experiences, but that that is what I have faced in this last year. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges, you know, outside of just this this specific position, but for uh, women Métis leaders who want to succeed in, um, you know, different. Uh, different areas, different corporations, or they want to, you know, become the CEO or a president of another company. You know, Métis women carry so many responsibilities for their families, for their communities. We have so many roles to play. And when you want to succeed in other realms, uh, you're often ch uh, forced to choose between, you know, serving your community, serving your family, or succeeding in whatever it is you want to succeed in. And we have to do our part in changing those positions to ensure that Métis women can do what they want to do, succeed in whatever career they want to succeed in, while also not having to choose between serving their community, their nation, or their family. And that's some of the work that I am trying to do, trying to talk about, working with different organizations to shape that future so that Métis women uh, can fill those positions and really succeed. And you had already touched on uh, my next question, but uh, maybe I'll just expand on it a little bit. Like, So you mentioned some of the personal challenges you faced since becoming president. I wonder if there's maybe a couple more that you could think of um, since coming into your role? Um, you know, this role specifically at the BT National Council, we've had a lot of work to do in this last year. Um, you know, this, this organization um, has a long way to go to evolve alongside of our governing members the Métis Nation British Columbia, Métis Nation Alberta, Métis Nation Saskatchewan and Métis Nation of Ontario have done some incredible work in the last number of years to evolve into Métis governments that serve their citizens. The Métis National Council has to evolve alongside of our Métis governing members to be able to do the work that they need us to do to advocate for them at the national and international levels. So uh, we're in a time Time of growth, we're in a time of uh, evolvement, and we're just doing so much work. But uh, you know, the outcome of that hard work is going to be incredible, and I know that we're going to be, and and we are doing some really great things to make sure that our governing members are represented. What uh, and and just kind of further to that, um, you know, what advice do you have uh, for other women who want to be leaders, whether it be in their community, um, in their local organization, just what advice do you have for other women who just want to be leaders? Well, I, first and foremost, I always say that every individual has leadership within them. It's not something that you have to go out and find. Everybody has leadership within them and they just have to foster that in whatever area that you're passionate about. You know, within our Métis communities, our artists are, are leaders, you know, our educators are leaders, parents are leaders. Everybody has that leadership within them and you just need to find what you're passionate about and pursue that. And I think that's the advice that I have for especially young Métis women is find what you're passionate about, pursue it. There is a role for everybody within our communities to play within the nation building process that we're currently in. And I encourage everybody to get involved in whatever way it is that they want to and, and pursue it. President Karen, I think that's a great way to end our conversation. I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, to you for coming on APTN in Focus and uh, sharing a bit of your thoughts with us. Thank you so much.
Next on In Focus is Melanie Dean of the Indigenous Leadership Development Institute. Now, the Institute is a 100% Indigenous owned and operated nonprofit, and their work focuses on building leadership capacity within Indigenous people. And I spoke with Melanie a bit earlier. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us here on APTN In Focus. Let's start off uh, for those that aren't familiar. Can you tell us about the Indigenous Leadership Development Institute? Hi, yes, very proud of the work that we do at ILDI. We are a 100% Indigenous owned and operated nonprofit organization um, that was established to build the capacity of Indigenous people across Canada. We've been around for 22 years now, and I've been with the Institute for 16 years. So when I started here, I was considered a youth. So I've grown and built my own capacity, and it's been a great opportunity. And seeing other people grow just like I did has been um, a really inspiring, um, inspiring outcomes of the work that we do. So um, can you, sorry, can you detail some of the work that you do and, and uh, your colleagues do as well? For sure. We're a small staff. We're um, about six people and we do it on purpose and we're all women. That's not by design. It's just the way things happen. And um, we deliver training, executive training sessions to Indigenous people. Our president and CEO, her name is Rosa Walker. She's from Peguis, First Nation. And she's the founder of the organization. She has this amazing story where she came from. She's worked for various other institutions, but she always saw the need for um, our people delivering training to our own people. Um, she was seeing non-Indigenous consultants being hired to offer services and coming in and deliver training sessions. Our communities were being gouged and uh, we're in the million dollar industry. So when she started the Institute, it took a lot of work for her to convince that our people can deliver quality training, just like the non-Indigenous consultants have done. And now she's been doing this for 22 years and our training sessions have just grown immensely. So why is it so important to have a program like this, Melanie? It's important because we know our people. When you hire a non-Indigenous consultant, you often have to give them training on how our communities work. We are from our communities. We know our people, we know our needs. So we can go in and deliver training that is specific to their outcomes. And we build capacity so they can do it, the work for themselves. And they don't need to hire someone to come in and do the work for them. We also have other projects. We've done um, women in, women leader programs over the years that saw some pretty amazing results. We also address um, the limited amount of women in trades programs. We wanted to see women advance in the trades industry. So we address that with some pretty fantastic outcomes. And so, uh, you had just mentioned uh, the, the women in leadership, and that's exactly what we're talking about today, is women taking on these leadership roles. How often do you see Indigenous women interested in taking on leadership roles in, in the work that you do? <clears throat> A lot of women. All women that I come across since I've been working here at the Institute have expressed their interest in wanting to be in leadership positions, but um, it's the fear of being criticized or feeling like they just don't have the capability to do it, but it's in them, it's within them. They just need some empowerment. Um, so a lot of our programs come from that empowerment approach. We bring in other women leaders to inspire them and encourage them to do the work. Um, it's that first step that's really scary. They have to stretch it, pull it, shape it. It's okay to be criticized at first, but over time, when you build build that, when you build your capacity, um, it turns into something really special, and it can only benefit our people more in the end. 
And Melanie, why is it so important for, for women to take charge and, and to want to be in these roles and, and, and to be a leader, whether it be in their community or their organization or uh, you know, in politics, why is it so important for women to take charge? For a couple of reasons, it improves the outcomes for everyone, not just women, but for society in general. The things that women have accomplished over the years have greatly benefit society, mainstream society and indigenous people. Um, also, we have to keep in mind our future generations. They are looking up to us or watching every step that we make. So it's really important that we step into those leadership positions, hear their story. Hear stories of women leaders is very important as well. And how have things changed over the years, I guess, in terms of the institute uh, and female involvement and, and women coming in and wanting to be leaders? And you had mentioned that a lot of the the when women come in, a lot of it is, is fear for, you know, not wanting to be, for whatever reason, the, the fear of trying to be a leader. But so how have things changed over the years that you've seen at the Institute regarding the, the women that come in and, and want to take the training? Um, some pretty fantastic results happen when you bring a group of women together in the same room over a long period of time. If you, we, one of our programs, we've recruited 20 women, 10 from the North and 10 from the South from First Nation communities. We put them together in a room and have them spend time with one another over a course of one year. They took training together, they had discussions together. And as a group, not designed part of the program, they just decided amongst themselves, there's this major election coming up. We need one of us to put our names forward. And nobody wanted to do it. No one raised their hand, no one stepped forward until the women came together and, and really just selected one person and said, you have to do it. It took some convincing, but she did it. And she won the election. And she's gone on to have a pretty, pretty fantastic career in politics. And what's that like for you to see something like that happen? And, and over the years, as these women come in and, and you guys are giving them the tools to succeed, I mean, what's it mean for you um, working at, at this organization? It means a lot. Um, a major component of the work that we do is our youth program, empowering Indigenous youth and governance and leadership. The acronym is EGLE. We have a lot of young people in our program who are looking for mentorship and people to look, look up to as leaders. They want to learn from them. And just having this pool of strong Indigenous women leaders doing these amazing things, they want to give back. So that, that's, that's what it means to us is it's not just creating the success it, um, part, being, it being successful, it's just seeing it carry on to future generations. And what do you hope uh, for the future in terms of, of uh, leadership training and, and women and, and youth in leadership roles? What do you hope happens for the future? Um, I hope to see more changes in the system. The system is set up to fail us. And the more I see women out there doing some pretty fantastic things, it can only change and transform and we can shape it into something that works and, uh, for the next generation. So I think that's what excites me the most is being able to witness the amazing things that women are doing right now. And what are some of the things uh, that the organization uh, and, and yourself are working on uh, towards the future? Are you able to share some of uh, some future plans with us? Yeah. So um, we are training. Our training. Our request for training is growing. We've done women programs. We started out with the one women's program when I first started the institute back in two thousand and six, um, and. The, since that was so successful, we've just kept it going. So we're always pushing, trying um, to build upon that because it's important when we do these sorts of projects, they call them pilots, um, pilot projects. Um, you finish, it has a, it has a life expectancy, expectancy for a year or two or three. And then once the program is over, it just ends, the file closes and that's it. No one heard about that and then you start pick up and try and start something new. But what this, what we're doing is um, it's growing, it's transforming, we're shaping it, we're learning from mistakes. So I think that's what main important message that we have um, for anybody is to have the courage to put yourself out there, be brave. It's hard, 
thinking that you're going to be um, criticized or looked looked at um, looked at. It's hard for for some of us to um, to have the spotlight on us and um, to be a leader. That in many ways, that's what it means. Even though there are women out there who are doing work kind of behind the scenes, we don't see them. But we, we the, the results do affect us. So I think that's what we strive to do is to give that spotlight for women to take a place in a leadership role and experience and encourage them. It's okay to fall down. I'm going to trip. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be messy, but we're going to get through it together. And that's so important that we maintain that message to women. Well, Mel Melanie, I think that's a great way to end our conversation. Uh, I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, to you for, for taking some time out of your day and sharing what you and your organization does and empowering so many women and, and youth and, and future leaders. So thank you. All right, that's all we have for you on today's APTN In Focus. Again, a thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Today's episode will be available as a podcast. You can listen and subscribe on aptnews.ca slash podcasts or find us on your favorite player. And if you missed any of our podcast episodes and want to catch up, uh, you can find them and more on aptnews.ca uh, slash in focus. Thank you for joining us, Miigwech, and have a great afternoon.